I'm very excited. I'm very excited uh, about the paper. Uh, I'm Thea and uh, I'm here to talk about my experience uh, as a Churchill student writing my first scientific paper. So to provide a sort of general introduction to what it's actually about, <laughs> um, my paper is on a disease called cholera, which I think most people have heard of. Um, and I think most people also know that diseases are caused by microbes, um, viruses, bacteria, fungi. And I think most people also know at this point that you can have different strains of the same disease, uh, like how we all have all these different strains of COVID that are causing problems at the moment. Um, and how you need to get a new flu jab every year because you need to be protected against the different strains that are causing disease every year. And so with cholera, uh, it's a disease that's caused by a bacteria and the bacteria is called Vibrio cholerae or V. cholerae for short. And with V. cholerae, just like with flu, uh, there are some strains that can cause mass infection um, so-called epidemic strains. Um, and then you've got some other uh, strains of V. cholerae that are much more chill, basically. Um, they live in, you know, salt water and they don't cause disease very often. So my project involved looking at uh, the genomes, so the DNA of all of these different kinds of V. cholerae, the, the epidemic ones, the ones that sometimes cause disease, the ones that mostly just hang out in the water living on crabs, and see what the differences are between those different groups. What we found, well, what I found when I was uh, working on this was that there's a particular enzyme uh, that you find in strains that don't cause epidemics that you don't find in the strains that do. Um, and what this enzyme lets the bacterium do is when the bacterium's just chilling in the water, uh, it allows it to attach to things that are made of a material called chitin, so crab shells, stuff like that. Uh, and what it'll let the bacteria do is it'll let it attach to those crab shells and basically eat them. Um, and when the bacteria is inside humans, uh, these enzymes also let the bacteria uh, attach to your gut and eat your intestinal mucus, which is a lovely mental image. <laughs> so I got into this, this project um, actually through, um, through some fellows at Churchill um, who put me in touch uh, with a group at the Sanger Institute just outside Cambridge. Uh, that work on cholera and the group is the Thompson Group and I was funded by the Amgen Foundation while I was there which was a great opportunity recommend the Amgen program to to anyone who's looking to do funding get funding for like a summer internship or whatever um, so yeah I was working with that group and I got access to all of the computing resources and stuff there which was incredible um, and as I mentioned, we found out that there was this enzyme that was quite interesting because it was present in bacteria that caused disease. Uh, sorry, <laughs> it wasn't present in the bacteria that, that caused uh, widespread disease and it was present in the others. Um, and that's potentially important because it can tell us, you know, a bit about how to tell which bacteria are more likely to cause like a widespread epidemic and which ones maybe aren't. Um, in terms of other findings, we also found out um, something about another protein, because enzymes are proteins, uh, called GBPA. Um, you don't need to worry about how it works or what GBPA stands for, um, but basically, in the same way that enzymes let um, bacteria attach to chitin or to your intestines, um, they let them digest them, uh, GBPA is similar, but it doesn't digest anything. It just lets bacteria stick to your gut or to a crab shell or whatever. And that was quite interesting um, from a sort of medical perspective because uh, GBPA is a protein that we find 
in a lot of strains of cholera. We thought it was found in all of them. Um, and it had even been suggested maybe we should use it to, to diagnose um, whether something is being caused by V. cholerae, whether that's causing disease. Um, but what uh, I found while I was at the Sanger is that actually that protein isn't present in all of the strains of cholera that we've isolated. Um, and that's quite important from, from a clinical perspective. Uh, so I've already talked a little bit about how it is I came to be doing this project. You know, I, my thanks go out to the Sanger Institute for having me there and for letting me work remotely for the last two years. And also to the Amgen Foundation for, you know, providing the funding that let me go there in the first place. Uh, in terms of why I was attracted to the project from a sort of nerdy academic perspective. Um, I was really keen to get into computational biology um, because biology is a field. The amount of data that's being generated is just sort of growing exponentially um, because we have all of this computational power and we have all these amazing methods uh, for sequencing genomes and for sequencing transcriptomes, RNA. Uh, and it's increasingly important to have skills like uh, programming and to be familiar with the kind of software pipelines that you can use to turn all of that big data into something that's actually biologically or medically useful. Uh, so from that perspective, um, I was just really excited to have the opportunity to work with this, this group that did, you know, some computational genomics at the Sanger. Uh, and I had a great time doing it. Like I went, got to go on, you know, all sorts of um, you know, supercomputer cluster training courses, and I started to learn Python, which I now have to use all the time, so that was useful. Um, but also, um, something that sort of hit me while I was working there, I remember I, I think it was on, on Tuesdays, there were cholera Tuesdays, you had um, uh, meetings of the people who, who researched cholera. Uh, and I went along to one of those while I was there, and uh, people were talking about sort of about the impact of, of the research um, and talking about you know some of the contexts that these bacterial samples had come from because with all of these different strains of, of V. cholera, of cholera bacteria, had come from all over the world. Um, and I was just looking at their genomes on a computer, um, but you know that they all came from disease outbreaks. And it kind of hit me at that point um, that. The research is cool, like it was incredible and a great experience. Uh, but I think it really made an impression on me that, oh yes, it's cool. And it's also important that this is actually supposed to have an impact and does have an impact on people's lives. Um, and I think as a student, it's very easy to lose sight of that because you spend so much time trying to memorize all of this information about bacteria and viruses and cancer and all sorts of things that it's very easy to sort of lose sight of the fact that research actually has applications. Um, so yeah, that was, that was an important experience. I, I definitely recommend that anyone who's studying science tries to get some experience of what sort of real-time research is like, because the feeling of, of understanding how it is that science kind of works in the wider world and why people do science in the first place is really important. But yeah, when you're, when you're getting into science as a student, you're just starting your career, it's very important to bear in mind that failure and rejection is just part of the process. I know that, you know, on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever, people tend to only report the times that they're successful in getting something done. Um, but the truth is that even when things don't work out, it's a learning experience. So, you know, definitely your first paper is an exciting time, but keep your like, expectations sort of reasonable. Don't be too hard on yourself. Don't too, put too much pressure on yourself for everything to work out. Um, to be honest, when I first um, had that sort of meeting where we discussed the possibility of writing a paper, so it was at the end of my internship and I was having a meeting with my PI at Sanger, uh, Professor Thompson. And he said at the end of it, yeah, no, this, this seems really good work that you've done here for the last, gosh, it's like two months. I was working there at the Sanger in person. 
And I kind of assumed when he said, yeah, this is good, you should publish, that he was joking. And then the, the PhD student who had been mentoring me at the Sanger, uh, Matt, who is also a fellow at Churchill, um, was really helpful. But he, he came up to me afterwards, basically, and he said, OK, right, we need to talk about how we're going to balance this with your degree. And that was when it hit me that, oh, no, this is actually a thing. This is actually happening. And it's been incredible. Uh, it's been a long process. Um, although I'm, <laughs> I'm told that two years is actually fairly normal uh, time to take to take a paper from like, hmm, maybe we should publish this to, ah, we are succeeding in publishing this. Um, but it's also been, I guess, particularly disrupted um, because of, you know, the pandemic. It's thrown us all into a bit of disarray for a while. Um, but, you know, things have pulled together. And now that I'm at the stage where I realize, oh, wow, this is a publication and, and I, I can read the preprint and it has my name on it, that's me, um, that's an incredible feeling um, and I think an equally incredible part of the experience has been sort of the, the sort of support and mentoring I've had through the process. Um, both, both Matt, as I mentioned, who's a fellow here at Churchill and also uh, my, my DOS, she's not my DOS anymore, but um, I'm a fourth year and for my second and third years, my DOS was Ritter Monson. And she provided some really useful uh, conversations through the whole thing. And she also was, you know, just generally a supportive person to talk to, which is nice. And I found that really helpful because actually, while you do get taught an awful lot of facts as an undergraduate, and you'll get to learn some practical lab skills in the lab and some computing skills, um, you don't get much of an introduction to uh, sort of scientific publishing as part of your course, as part of your sort of taught lectures and practicals and stuff. Um, and that's fair enough because you've already got an awful lot to learn. Uh, but I think for people who want to, you know, take their science degree um, and go into sort of actual research, uh, it's really important to, to have those people there to sort of support and guide you through that process because it's not obvious, it's not intuitive, you get a lot of emails, you don't necessarily know which of them are priority and which of them you've sort of just been copied into for formality's sake. Um, so that's definitely something that takes some getting used to um, and I feel really lucky to have been at Churchill to be honest because you know, as you probably noticed, uh, Matt and Ritter, who, again, thanks, guys. Um, I People I got to meet because I was in this environment here. And, you know, I'm at the start of my career, and this is an exciting thing. And I kind of know it couldn't have happened um, if I hadn't been at this college, or at least it might not have done. Um, so, yeah, I guess to summarise my feelings on the paper, um, grateful to the people who helped it happen. Um, proud of myself for, for managing to uh, get to this stage despite everything that's happened in the last uh, year or so. And also just, woo, we, we, we did it. It's a good feeling. Uh, 10 out of 10 would recommend.